All right. So, good morning, everybody. Um, oh, 16. We hit the magic number. 16. Okay. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you today. Um, I was just saying to those that were already in here, I hope that you had a, a good um, weekend, and uh, I hope that uh, you, you didn't get sunburned with all the hours that you were outside, um, <laughs> but it, it really has been very nice, so uh, continue to get out, and uh, I don't know about for you, but for me, it's, it's, it's kind of uplifting to get out there and, and be outside instead of inside trapped behind a wall of snow during quarantine. So get outside and take advantage of it. Especially today, I think it's supposed to be 70. Tomorrow, actually, today 57, but a little rainy. But tomorrow, especially tomorrow, get outside and take advantage of that. Okay. Um, today, we are going to be going over section 3.3, 4.1, and 4.2 uh, problems. So if you've got any questions about problems from there, um, go ahead and throw those in the chat or just ask them out loud and we can handle those. If you've got any questions about the test or questions about anything in general, um, I do have one for you, but uh, um, uh, if you've got something about the test, go ahead and, and ask it in the chat or out loud either way. I'll give a, a few seconds here and then if there are no questions about it, then I will ask my question. and. We'll continue. So no one has any questions about the test or the grading or anything like that? Can we go over question 19? Do you have to go to come to Do you have to come to office hour meetings? No, you don't. I, we can do it here. Yeah, for sure. We can do that in just a few minutes, Saria. Well, maybe I'll ask my question, and then um, while it's being answered, you can think about your questions. So my question is: uh, Are you able to see on Blackboard? Uh, are you able to see your tests now? I got an email saying that they could, someone couldn't see their test, and so I, I went in and it, okay, we can see them now. Good, and you can see my markings and everything. You can see my comments. Great, 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 great. Okay, good. Uh, when I had that first email, I was a little concerned that something was going wrong, because that's that's the way I, I get back to you on some of those things. So I was afraid I was going to have to print out your tests scan them and email them to you or take screenshots of everybody's pages and email them to you. Good. Yeah, when technology works, it saves everyone time. <laughs> okay, so we're, did anyone come up with any other questions? If not, we'll go ahead and start with question 19. Seeing any here? Eleven. Yes, of course. Oh, nineteen. Yeah. Okay. Yep, that one. Yeah, 19 is um, it's just a, a sort of a less familiar type of question uh, asking you about something that you are familiar with, right? Um, and usually when you phrase, you know, as a, as a teacher, when you phrase a, a, a familiar question in a different way, you catch a lot of people off guard. And that, that's the point of question 19 is to is sort of test transferability of of your understanding of in particular the vertical line test so we'll go through 19 and we'll go through 11 here as well 11 is uh, it's just a straightforward um, question
question about. Okay, good. We are in business. The straightforward question about um, algebraic manipulation using rules of exponents. I'll go ahead and do that one first. So again, this is question. Okay, number eight as well. Yes. Okay. Keep them going. Keep them going. If there's more questions, we'll, we'll answer them. So uh, we'll, we'll, keep, we'll continue with 11. 11 it says to simplify the expression and eliminate any negative exponents. And we're starting with this square root of x to the negative 2y squared over 64x to the sixth y to the first. Okay, so everything is underneath the radical in this question. And so <clears throat> for for the for the first parts, we're gonna forget the radical exists. At least that's the way I tend to do this, is I, I tend to just forget that the radical exists and do everything uh, that I know with fractions. And then after the fact, I'll sort of remember that there's a radical sign being carried through. Um, so what I mean by that is, let's not worry about the radical yet. Let's handle everything inside. So inside, we have a couple things. I see that there's a y squared on top and there's a y on the bottom. I notice that the power two is bigger than one. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring this y up to the top. And the way I can think of doing that is like multiplying by y to the negative one on top and bottom. Okay. Uh, and what that gives us is x to the negative two still. And this is the, yes, exactly, Jay. That is the rule. That's exactly how the rule comes about, actually. So, so this turns into y to the two minus one, right? That is the rule that Jay is reminding us of. That's sort of like the proof for why it works that way. Okay, oh, I almost forgot. There's a radical, right? Okay, so we've handled the y's actually at this point because this is just y to the first power, two minus one. I'm gonna do the same thing now with the x. Uh, I notice that x to the negative two, it's not something I like. I like positive power. So I'm gonna multiply the top by x squared and I'm gonna do the same thing on bottom. And I'm sure as, as Jay would point out, this is the same as uh, taking the uh, six on the bottom and adding two to it. So this is the same as the square root of y over 64 x to the six plus two. Okay, now usually, right, if you bring something from one side to the next of the fraction, from one top, the top to the bottom, or bottom to the top, you subtract exponents. But here we're subtracting a negative two. So that makes it a plus two. Okay. So now I'm gonna carry out the radical because we've, we've taken care of every single positive, we've, we've, we've taken care of cancellation of all of the, uh, the the factors. We've canceled x's with x's, y's with y's, and we've added exponents or subtracted exponents where necessary. So now I'm actually going to carry out this uh, this square rooting. And I'm going to do that by turning it into square roots of everything individually. So there were two nice properties of radicals that allow us to do this, and they are the square root of a product a times b is the square root of a times the square root of b. It's a product of square roots. Square root of a product is the product of the roots. Another one was if you have a root of a fraction, a over b, that's the same as the fraction of the roots. So I'm just applying both of these rules up to that and we get that, what I've written. And that gives us our final answer, root y divided by eight 
x to the fourth. This is x to the fourth because remember, the square root is really the same as raising something to the one half power. x to the eighth raised to the one half power. There's a rule for that which says just multiply the powers together. And half of eight is four. Okay. Question eight, one of the true false ones. Um, this is just an application of um, an application of uh, and maybe my answer key was wrong on this one. I might have to go back. Let's see. Uh, I, if I remember correctly, I what did I have for a solution here? I had true. Okay, let me let me take a look at it. So eight is three over x minus one cubed equals twenty seven. And I'm gonna write that like this over x minus one cubed. And now this is true. Okay, this is this is definitely true. This is just an application of um, the property, if you have a over b raised to some power n, that's the same as a to the n over b to the n, so long as b is not zero. Uh, okay, so long as b is not zero. Well, b is zero when x equals one, so we cannot allow x to equal one. But if x is not one, then these two are always equal. And I'm looking now at the question and it says, except zero or one. Well, if you plug in zero, you get the same value on both sides. So that's not entirely true. So I think I'm gonna have to go back and give credit on that one if you answered, if you answered false. So I'm correcting my key right now. False. It's true for zero. But it is not true for one. But the question says it's true for for everything but both those. So that's not entirely true. It's close. I'm glad you asked that question. Who was that? Romung. I'm, I'm glad you asked that. If you got that one wrong, I'll go back. I'll go back through everybody's test to make sure I've got that corrected. Okay, the next question. Nineteen. Nineteen was this question where you've got this piecewise function. So it splits up the real line, the inputs, the domain, and it says there's two possible outputs here, depending on where you're at on the real line. If the input is less than or equal to 10, the rule is 1. So like if I plugged in 1, well that's less than or equal to 10, so I would get 1. Or if I plugged in like negative 10, well, I, that's less than or equal to 10, so I would get 1. But the second rule is negative 1 when x is bigger than or equal to negative 10. Okay, so like h of 15, that's negative 1. If I plug in 15, that's bigger than negative 10, so the rule is negative 1. But I could also like plug in one, do this one again. That's bigger than negative 10. But there's a problem here because I should get negative one now. And what about negative 10? Is negative 10 bigger than or equal to negative 10? Yes, it is. So this one also is negative one. So this is not a function and See, I know you're familiar with definitions of functions, and I know if you had a graph, you could easily check if something was a function uh, with the vertical line test. And this, 
if you graft this, it fails the horizontal line test terribly. This is the this is the question type that I suspect you're very familiar with, right? Um, but perhaps just not in this form. So it's a little bit different. So here's the graph of it. Here's negative 10. Here's 1. Here's negative 1. And here's 10. As it currently is, for anything at 10 or less, we're at a height of 1. Okay, that's, that's the graph of this first rule. For the second rule now, from negative 10 and up, we're at a height of negative 1. That's the second rule now. So this fails the vertical line test horribly. Um, so the question asks, what's something you could change to make this a function? And the idea is you just need to get rid of the overlapping parts. So you could do something like what I'll do here in red. You could make this an open circle at negative 10, which means changing this to a strict inequality, getting rid of that, and get rid of this part, right, the red part, like just delete that. And how do you do that? Well, you change this 10 to a negative 10. Okay, so what that would do which I'll now graph in red is it makes this rule go like that. That's one way you could do it. Uh, another way you could do it is and I think this is this next one is the simplest and I d actually saw this quite a few times, this is a really good solution, is take either of these, the one or the negative one, and just change it to the other one. So make this a negative one as well. Or make this one a positive one as well. So if you do that, then what you get is just a constant line If you've changed them both to plus one, that's that's a nice situation, so we'll do that. If you change them both to plus one, well, then you just get this horizontal line at a height of one. And that, that's a really slick solution. So that's h of x equals one or one, <laughs> no matter what. Okay. So there's lots of different things you could do there. It was totally up to you. It was open-ended. Okay, so I, I suspect that answers everybody's questions. If I didn't answer your question, uh, throw it in the chat. Uh, or if you needed more clarification than what I gave, please throw it in the chat as well. Uh, I think that I've answered your questions. seeing anything. Maybe you're just thinking about how to write it. So I'll turn to the section in the book we're going to go over and give you a few more seconds here. Okay, well I'm ready, so we'll go ahead and move on. I don't see any questions in the chat. I don't hear anyone talking. So we'll go ahead and move on. We are looking at section 3.3 .3, and this is polynomial polynomial division. Um, we have done a lot of this, <clears throat> but we've never really like carried it out. We've looked at rational expressions before, so, so this is something we've studied, but we've never actually carried out the division. Um, and in the lecture for this section, I actually did quite a few examples. So um, 
to me, I can, I can go through a couple more examples, but I don't want to spend too much time on this section. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick a problem and, and I'll do it and then I'll do, uh, I'll do one the long way and then I'll do one using synthetic division um, but then I'm gonna like I think that's enough but if that's not enough just tell me and we can do more okay okay um, so I'm just gonna pick them from something later on so I'm gonna pick 24 from the book 24 is this problem it says, find the quotient using long division. So 24 is 2x to the fifth minus 7x to the fourth minus 13 divided by or over 4x squared minus 6x plus 8. so we're supposed to find this quotient. So this is going to be some, some function of x plus some remainder function of x over the divisor d of x. d of x here is just this bottom part, right? 4x squared minus 6x plus 8. So our result is going to look like this that I've written on the right side. It's going to be some function of x plus some remaining fraction. Okay, so let's go ahead and get to that. Uh, as in the, the movie, the lecture, what we do is we take the divisor and we take the, I'm gonna delete the, the title here, and we delete the uh, sort of the, the form of it. Yeah, that's not what I wanted. There we go sort of rearrange things, we write it like this. Okay, And that's really easy for me to do on the computer. For you, on your scratch paper, just don't write the original fraction. Another thing that I suggested in the lecture, and this is, this is something that's really kind of a very nice organizational step, is to make some space underneath here for all of the missing terms. So in this problem, we have 2x to the fifth minus 7x to the fourth minus 13. Where's the x cubed? There's, there's nothing. So let's just put plus or minus, it doesn't really matter, 0x cubed. And there's no x squared, so let's put a 0x squared. Well, and there's no x, so let's put plus 0x. Okay. You don't have to do this, but it, it can make your life easier. And so if you just if you follow this process every time, you get into a habit of putting them in, uh, there will never be a problem that throws you off. Whereas if you practice with nice ones, where the, there's always all of those terms, and then you come across one where there is nothing in one, I've seen students get thrown off. Even though they know how to do the long division, they just they don't know what to do suddenly when there's something missing. So, all right, so we'll go ahead and do this now. We've got it set up. The repeating question over and over is, it's what do we need to multiply this leading term by, 4x squared, to get the next available term. So we haven't even started. So the next available term is this first thing, 2x to the fifth. So I always write these down. What do we need to multiply 4x squared by to get the next available term, 2x to the fifth? What do you think?
Is anyone there? What do you think? <laughs> what do we multiply 4x squared by to arrive at 2x to the fifth? One over x to the negative three. That's close, I mean, that is x cubed, really. So yes, that's, that's partially, right? x cubed. Yeah, so, and Michael, you got it. You got it. Um, and Shingy, you've got it, yes. A lot of people got it, thank you so much. Okay, so, yeah, I like to handle this in two separate steps. I like to handle the coefficients. So I, th I ask myself, four times what number is two? And that's one half. And then I handle the, the uh, variables. x squared times what is x to the fifth? And that's x cubed. If you add those exponents, then you've got yourself, uh, you've got yourself the correct answer there. Okay, so that's what we need to multiply by in order to get that. Now all these extra things, I've, like I said in the lecture, uh, they don't really come into play here. They come into play next. Uh, but the, the repeating question is, what do I multiply the leading term by to get the next available term? Okay, and we'll, I'll list those here on the left. So let's now distribute this through in multiplication. We know we get 2x to the fifth here. That's by design. Uh, and I'll write these ones actually in green. So this is the product. Okay, and then the next one is minus 3x to the fourth minus uh, plus 4x cubed. This is just like in long division, right? You you pick the number that goes up here, and then you multiply it by that guy, and you write the result down here, and then you do a subtraction. So here we go, we're gonna subtract. This by design is zero. Negative seven x to the fourth plus three x to the fourth is minus four x to the fourth. 0x cubed minus 4x cubed is minus 4x cubed. As I'm going, please keep me honest if I miss a negative sign, because that will really mess things up. So keep me honest and keep an eye open for that. Okay, so we can bring down the next term if we want, but it's just a 0x squared. We might as well. Then we ask ourselves the same question. Uh, 4x squared times what is the next available leading term? It is, is negative x to the fourth. What do we multiply that by? What goes here? Negative x squared is correct. The negative sign, because that changes the four to a negative four. The x squared, because that adds exponents with the other x squared to give us x to the fourth. So I notice that this is a negative x squared, so this up here becomes a minus x squared. And then we do this distribution, All right? We, we multiply negative x squared times everything here which I'll write in green again. So this is negative four x to the fourth by design. That's what we chose it to be. Um, and then negative x times, negative x squared times negative six x is plus six x cubed. Negative x squared times eight is negative eight x squared. And then we just Go ahead and do the subtraction, which gives us zero. 
negative 4 minus 6 is negative 10 now. Numbers are starting to get kind of big. Okay, and then 0 minus a negative 8, so plus 8x squared. We can bring down the next term even though it's 0. And then we rinse and repeat. Here's our next available leading term. So 4x squared times something is negative 10x cubed. We ask ourselves, what is that thing we need there? What is that factor we need there? And what is it? I like to handle them separately. I like to handle the coefficients and the x, the powers of x separately. The power of x in this case is the simple one. We're missing just a power of x, just one of them. And then for the coefficient, we know we need a negative sign because we go from a positive 4 to a negative 10. So there's a negative sign there. <clears throat> and we need 4 times something to equal negative 10. So how about this? How about negative 10 fourths? Then the fours would cancel, right? We could simplify that, negative 5 halves, of course. But how about, how about this form right here? That makes a lot of sense, right? So this is a pretty common thing in problems like this is you just take this divided by this and that's the coefficient that goes here. Okay. So again, you take the you take this coefficient on the right and you divide it by this coefficient on the left and that's what you put here. Okay? What's the, I think there's a nice joke about this. 95% of the time works every time, right? <laughs> so we've, we've got our result. It's negative, and here I'll simplify it, negative 5 halves x. Okay. Everybody with me? I hope so. Okay, so... Then we repeat ourselves. Uh, we multiply this negative 5 halves x throughout. And we know we get negative 10x cubed here. That's always the easy one. That's how we chose this number. The next ones are less easy. So 5 halves of 6, that's 5 times 3, so that's 15. So this is plus 15x squared. If I if I needed to, you you know, or if you needed to, you would just do the scratch work off to the side. Negative 6 times negative 5 halves. This cancels with this. That's a 3 now. So negative 3 times negative 5 is 15. Negative signs cancel. Okay, and then for the last one, it's 8 times negative 5 halves. Okay, the 8 cancels with the 2 to be 4. 4 times negative 5 is negative 20. <clears throat> so this becomes a minus 20x. Then we do the subtraction. This is nothing. This is 8 minus 15, so that's negative 7x squared. And 0 minus a negative 20 means plus 20x minus 13. And we are almost done. This is a great example because it takes us all the way through it. And we just rinse and repeat. 4x squared, this leading term here, times what is negative 7, excuse me, is negative 7x squared. Notice we don't need any x's. We've got the same power of x. So this is 
We're almost done. We just have to handle the coefficient. What is the coefficient factor we need? We take this and divide it by this, and we've got it. Negative 7 fourths. Yes, exactly, Alex. If you, if you can't see that, we will just write this out. 4 times something is negative 7. Well, if we take the right side and divide it by the left side, it's, I think it becomes very obvious that's what we should be using because then the 4 will cancel with the 4 and we get negative 7 equals negative 7. So that's a tried and true method for figuring out those coefficients. So it's minus 7 fourths here. And then we multiply negative 7 fourths through our polynomial on the left, which we'll do the divisor. Negative 7 fourths times 4x squared is negative 7x squared by design. Negative 7 fourths times 6, oy, uh, this becomes 6 times 7 over 4, so 3 times 7 over 2. which is 21 halves. And negative sign cancels out, right? Negative sign on 6, negative sign on 7 fourths, and we've got that. So plus 21 halves x. 7 fourths times 8. That becomes well, the 8 cancels with the 4 to give it to become a 2. So 2 times negative 7 is negative 14. Okay, everybody with me there? Because the next thing we do is the last step. We just subtract. This is 0. This is not as easy. This is, neg this is 40 halves x, that's 20x, minus 21 halves x. So how many halves do we have left? We have 19 halves. That one's not as easy. 20x is the same as 40 halves x. We're taking away 21 of those halves. So we have 19 left. And then negative 13 minus a negative 14. So plus 14 is plus 1. And we're basically done. It's a long problem, but it shows us the entirety of it. So now we've got our remainder term. In blue, we've got what I called earlier q of x. So some function of x. And notice there's no fractions involving the divisor. But now, here at the end, I'll write this in brown, we've got the, the addition of the remainder. How do I know this is the remainder down here? Well, this is the remainder because its degree, which is 1, is less than the degree of our divisor. So once you get to this point where you've you know taken all these steps, once you get to this point, of the leftovers, the remainders, being degree less than the degree of your divisor. Everything that is there is your remainder. So what I always like to do is just put a plus sign. Okay, don't put a minus sign, put a plus sign. And then put everything on top of a fraction Okay, just put everything on top of a fraction. So if this was like negative 19 halves my, uh, plus 1, still just put a plus sign and then throw everything up top. Okay. And then on bottom, you write the divisor. So 4x squared minus 6x plus 8. So this is r of x 
divided by d of x. And that is the result of this division. So I know that's a long problem. I definitely know it's a long problem, but this is still not even that complicated of one. This is only an x to the fifth problem, and there's three terms, and it's being divided by x squared. So, I mean, we could we could make this worse, like way worse. X Use something like x to the 20th <laughs> in our dividend, and then use x to the third in our divisor, and it would be a far worse problem. But the process doesn't change. So this, this is a good one where it takes you step by step and you, you can't ever skip a step. There are lots of problems that you can accomplish in two steps or three steps instead of what we did, one, two, three, four steps. Um, okay. So like I said in the lecture, um, long division, this process is more powerful than the next thing that I'm going to show you because this is uh, this is something that you can use uh, for any division of polynomials okay any division by polynomials it doesn't have to be division by a line it can be division by a, a quadratic or a, 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 a third degree or fourth degree or fifth degree okay all right so the next thing if I can clear the screen is to talk about something called synthetic division. So like I said, this is only something only something you can do if you're dividing by a line. So what I'll do is I'll show you one of those. So we're going to take this one which looks really gross and I'm going to I'm going to show you how nice synthetic division is. So this one looks bad. But here we go. It is 3 x to the fifth, let me use black ink, I used that color for the remainder earlier, this is 3x to the fifth plus 5x to the fourth minus 4x cubed plus 7x plus 3. So it's 3x to the fifth, 5x to the fourth, minus 4x cubed, plus 7x plus 3, divided by uh, x plus 2. Okay? x plus 2. So what we're going to be doing here is uh, we're going to use something called synthetic division, and something that synthetic division does is it eliminates the repetitive process of writing down these x's and their powers at all times. So we're going to translate this division problem into synthetic form here. Uh, and the first step is to figure out what's the zero here? What is the zero of the denominator? Okay, and that is negative two. So we're going to take the zero and we're going to put that right here. I'm just going to place it there on the side. Let me move it over. I think I'm going to need a little more space. Okay. Then what we do is we draw sort of an upside down division sign. And what we write in there are just the coefficients. Because remember in that process of long division when we're adding and subtracting powers of x really what we're doing is we're adding and subtracting coefficients that's where the that's where the meat of the problem is and we don't care that 3x to the fifth is going to be subtracted by another 3x to the fifth we just care that 3 minus 3 is 0 right we don't care about the x to the fifth we just make sure we line things up so we write these coefficients down 3 5 negative 4 and then we need to be very, very careful. If you continue and you write 7, 3, you're going to get the answer wrong. You can write those 
but you need to write first the zero coefficients. There's no x squared here. There's no x squared, so we have to write a zero. Okay, so don't forget that. If you're doing a synthetic division problem and you can't get it, and you've tried it a few times, but you just can't get it, please make sure that you've written all the zero coefficients for any missing terms. So we've got a zero there for the x squared term that's not there. And then we have 7, and then we have 3. OK, then the next thing you do, when, when I learned this, I said this in the video, I didn't draw it this way, but they say draw a line here. Now, like when I learned this, I didn't draw a second line. I just made this top thing bigger. OK, so it doesn't matter to me what you do. You could write it without any lines. They're just there to help you organize. So I'll do it like the book does it. OK. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to take the sum of this column right here. What is that sum? That sum is just 3 plus nothing. So that's 3. That's what you do for the first column. Every column after this is different. But every column which follows is also going to be the same. So the, what you do to, for every other column is you take this product, the 0 times this sum, and that goes right here. So negative 2 times 3 is negative 6. What do we do then? We take this sum, which is negative 1. What do we do next? Take this product, positive 2. What do we do next? Oops. That's positive 2. We add this column. Next, take this product. Add this column. Take this product add this column, take this product, add this column. And I claim that we have just done polynomial long division. And I claim that this is 3x to the fourth minus x to the third minus 2x squared plus 4x minus 1 plus 5 over x plus 2. Okay. That's synthetic division. you wanted to go through and, and do the long division, remember all you'd be doing is working with <clears throat> adding and subtracting coefficients. And that's what this whole thing does. It very succinctly does that long division process of subtracting and adding coefficients together in a very, very short form. right? And it's a very, very fast form. Now, how did I know this was 3x to the fourth, x cubed, and et cetera, et cetera? Well, there's a nice little thing that happens when you divide by a line. The degree of every term up here, x to the fifth, x to the fourth, x cubed, et cetera, et cetera, down the line. When you divide by something to the first, their powers get reduced by 1. It's no different than taking just x cubed and dividing by x. That just reduces the power by 1. So I, I knew for sure that this x to the fifth term was going to be reduced to an x to the fourth term. This x to the fourth term was going to be reduced to an x cubed term. 
and etc. down the line. This 7 was an x to the first, which means this gets turned into an x to the zeroth power. So that means that this is always the remainder portion. Right. Questions on synthetic or long division? Otherwise, I'm moving on. Quick question, I guess. If you divide by some linear factor, so let's say let's say I did this problem, and I actually found instead of getting 5, what if I got 0? What if this here was instead 0? In terms of our original dividend, what does that mean about x plus 2 if I get 0 there? It means it's a factor. It means if I were to factor out that polynomial, I could pull out an x plus 2. Right? If I, if I remember that other form of the line, if this is 0, well, then this term doesn't exist, which means that the division by x plus 2 is just this, which means if I just like the other form, multiply by x plus 2, what do I get back? I get the whole thing back. So if you're doing a division problem and you've discovered that through your polynomial long division or synthetic division that the remainder is nothing, it means you've just found a factor. And consequently, you've just found a 0 too. It's a really handy sort of correlation there. If you've found a linear factor, you've also found a zero, in our case negative two. Okay, but that wasn't the problem at hand, so what we have is not that. So x plus two is not a factor, and consequently negative two is not a zero. <clears throat> um, I am going to put a poll question up here momentarily just to make sure that everybody's still around. <laughs> uh, I'm just, I'm writing it right now just to make sure that we're there. So here we go. Maybe it'll work. Maybe it won't. Ah. For some reason, it logged me out of Zoom. Okay, we're gonna have to take. We're gonna have to handle that at another time. Okay. 
So I want to ask you a question first about exponentials. Is this the poll question? No, no, it's not the poll question. I was, I had a poll question here. I hadn't finished typing it before class, and I finished writing it just now while I was saying that. And then I clicked save, and it logged me out of Zoom. I guess I had, my time had expired. So <clears throat> this will take me uh, one second to write it again. Um, oh, there we go. Okay, let's see if it saves it now. saved it now. Boom, there we go. All right, go ahead and answer this poll question. I'll give you a couple minutes to think about this one. And I will get the next problem ready. Uh, I listed them. I was I thought I would give options. Degree 5 is A. Base 5 is B, positive outputs is C, negative outputs is D, two zero outputs would be E, like in a multiple choice question. All of the above is everything above. Just A and C is just the first and the third options. Just B and D is base 5 and negative outputs. Okay. And 5 caret X is 5 to the X power. Looks like 18 of us ended up showing up, so two people joined in a little late. That's great. It's good to have everyone. Still missing four now. I'll give you just three now. I'll give you another minute, those three of you. In about 30 seconds, I'll just ask you to throw an answer in, whether or not you know it or not. Right. just one person so it's been 30 seconds so that to whoever that is I, I can't see who it is or not right now but whoever it is go ahead and just throw an answer in whether or not you've got it just let me know you're there again this ha if you get it wrong it has no impact on your grade but not submitting something does possibly <laughs> so go ahead and throw something in if you're there Gonna go ahead and guess not there. Okay, so here we go. Share results. Lots of people said base five. That is in fact correct. That is one of the correct options. Degree five. Degree is something we use for polynomials. Uh, degree describes the highest power of a polynomial. So you look at all the terms of a polynomial and you select the one with the highest power of x and that's the polynomial's degree. Uh, that's at least in the context of, of functions that's what degree usually means. 
our degree is technically x. So it has no constant degree. Uh, and positive outputs is also correct. 5 to the x is never negative. It only has positive outputs. So D, negative outputs, is not correct. Nobody said that. 2, 0 outputs is definitely not correct. Nobody said that. All of the above is not quite right. Um, just A and C is not right. Just B and D is not right. I wanted B and C to be the correct answer. So those of you who said B or C, you got it. You got it. In my haste to retype this, I must have mistyped A and C and something like that. Sorry about that. Hey, if you, if you put either B or C, you, you did really great. Okay. It's a good thing this has no impact on your grade, except that you're here. Well done. <laughs> okay. All right, that's it for polling today. So now we're going to look at some exponentials. Um, so let's let's throw a graph up of one. Um, let's go ahead and just pick two times three to the x plus one. We're going to go ahead and graph this real quick. Exponential graphs. Once you've graphed two or three of them, it's it's really 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 quick to do this. Uh, with exponentials, uh, there's there's always that parent function like we've used before. So the parent function here is 3 to the x. No product by 2, no vertical shift by 1. So what this will do, this 2, it will stretch it out vertically. And what this 1 will do is this will lift it vertically. So I'm going to graph real quickly in pink the 3x, 3 to the x. 3 to the x, if we just remember that ta making a table of values, we're going to plug in 0. And for every exponential parent function, you're going to get 1. Every single time, you'll just get 1. When you plug in 1, you're going to get 3 to the first, so that's 3. So let me uh, when graphing exponentials, I like to have a compressed y. Uh, axis compared to the x-axis because exponentials grow really quickly so a, a, a tip would be to don't put too many tick marks on your x-axis but put a lot of tick marks on your y-axis okay okay so like I said when we plug in 1 to this parent function we're gonna get 3 so 1 2 3 right here when we plug in 2 we're gonna get 9 3 squared, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. It's like way up here. Exponentials grow really fast. At 3, what are we at? We're at 27. 3 to the third is 27. So the point here is 27 units up. That's really high. So I can't graph it. Um, when we plug in negative 1, what do we get? We get 3 to the negative 1 is 1 over 3. So this is 1 third. At negative 2, we get 1 over 3 squared, which is 1 ninth. 1 27th is next. I said in the lecture that exponentials all pretty much look the same. So long as the base, 3, in this case, the base is bigger than 1, it looks like this. If the base is smaller than 1, it's just reversed, it's just flipped. So it would look like this. If the base is between 0 and 1, that's what it looks like. If the base is bigger than 1, it looks exactly like what we graphed here. It might increase faster or slower, but it looks exactly like this. Goes through the point 0, comma 1, it gets really small here, and it gets really big here. Okay. All right, so that is our parent function, 3 to the x. So what is this new function? Well, what we're going to do first is we're going to scale it vertically. We're going to stretch it vertically, multiply it by 2. Everything gets 
twice as far from the x-axis. So this 1 becomes a 2. This 3 becomes a 6. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. This 9 becomes an 18, and that's off my chart already. This 1 third becomes 2 thirds. This 1 ninth becomes 2 ninths. This 1 27th becomes 2 27ths. So here's the red graph is the graph of 2 times 3 to the x. And so now what do we do after that? We shift it vertically. Okay, we're just going to lift the red graph up by one unit. Now, I, on the computer, can cheat when doing this. This is not something that you can do on your, <clears throat> on your, um, on your pencil and paper test, but here's what I can do. I'm going to take my x-axis and lower it one. There it is. <laughs> so that's really, you know, it's, we're just lifting the whole thing up by one. So plus one now. So this intersection point, which was before, right, it initially was down here at one, zero, one. We multiplied it by two to move it up two, uh, up to two, rather. And then we lifted it one, so this is now the point zero, three. If we plugged in zero here, we'd get two times one plus one. Okay, so we've graphing any exponential. It should be that easy. <clears throat> it should be just use your ideas of function transformations to graph them, and they exponentials are rather straightforward to graph because they all look this way. Um, so that's it for graphing. Uh, next, we'll do some interest questions, uh, some so, or some uh, compounding questions. Okay, unless there's questions on graphing these. Okay, so I'm going to do a compounding interest problem. I did an example of this in the lecture as well. So, <clears throat> uh, you know what? Let's do this one instead. We did we did a, in a compound interest problem in the uh, in the lecture. So let let's do a different one. This one is very similar to um, very similar to a homework problem. It's question fifty four. A certain breed of mouse was introduced onto a small island with an initial population of 320 mice. And scientists, I know you can't see this just yet, but uh, once I finish writing it, it'll be there. As scientists estimate that the population is doubling every year. A find a function n that models the number of years sorry the number of mice that's a different question after t years and b find the number of mice now uh, predicted mice i'm going to correct them uh, find the number of predicted mice after 8 years Okay, there's the question. All right, so this one's just like one of your one of your uh, homework problems that deals with uh, bacteria population that doubles every hour. This is this is mice, and they double every year. So, if we just think about it in terms of you know just making a table of values, after zero years, we're at three hundred and twenty. 
right? That's the initial population. After one year, what's the population? Let's double that. That's what they're predicting. So 640. What did we do? We took this and we multiplied it by two. Okay, after two years, it doubles again. So 640 times two, and now the numbers are really getting kind of big, it's 1280. What we did is we took this times two. Or what we could have done is take this first one times two times two, which is squared. After three years, we take 1280 and we double that again. And that gives us, oh boy, two, five, six, zero. Okay, or another way to do it is to take the initial value and multiply it by two three times. So this is times two cubed. Okay, so what are we seeing here? We're seeing this number of mice after t years. It has something to do with 320 times two to some power of t. This is the general form of what we're, we're looking at here. Is this the exact form? Well, we just need to ask ourselves, like it, maybe there's a minus one, maybe there's a plus something here, I don't know. We'll, we'll just compare it with data now. So let's look at just this function and we'll see if it fits exactly or not. We plug in zero to t, we get 320 times two to the zeroth, that is one, so that, that works. 320 times two to the first is 640, that works. It appears as though, after checking just two points, this is gonna work, and it does. Um, sometimes there is like a, a, a translation here, minus one. Sometimes there is an additional addition of something here, but not in this problem. This problem is just a bit more straightforward than that. So my point is, when, a when answering questions like this, go to a table, make a table and then look at this factor and how it plays in in some general way. And you're kind of asking yourself, instead of repeatedly multiplying, sort of in this table like I did, is there a way to jump from the start all the way to the end of the list of my table with just one thing? That one thing sort of gives you the form of what you're dealing with. Is that clear? In the bacteria question, it's actually the same thing. You're going to have your initial population times 2 to some power t. Because it's doubling. If it was tripling, it'd be a 3 to the t. If it was quadrupling, it'd be a 4 to the t. But you get your exponential growth rate, your your base there. Usually, usually in this class, it's just given to you. Okay, now for part two. We're asked, this is part A. Part B, we're asked what is the number of predicted mice after eight years? This is immediately where you go to a calculator. <laughs> and you're like, two to the eighth. What is two to the eighth, right? 320 times two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256. What is 320 times 256? That's it, whatever that is, okay? On, on tests that I give you, that is a perfectly acceptable answer because you're not allowed to use a calculator. So this would, this would be like perfect, 100% correct. I don't expect you to multiply that out longhand. For WebAssign, I think they might require that you multiply it out. So go ahead and use a calculator on WebAssign, okay? For problems like this. Okay. All right.
the next section 4.2 was on the natural exponential function so for this um, I'm gonna it's such a so it's, it is such a short um, such a short section uh, in the lecture what I did was I compared an interest example with compound interest and I compared it to a continuously compounding interest question and uh, I explained how to how you can get from continuous uh, how you can get to continuous from compounding interest um, and I did an example of it there's really not too much more um, so what would you like to see? Would you like to see, I've got time for one more example, what would you like to see? A, a compound interest problem, a continuously interest, continuously compounding interest problem? What would you like? It's up to you. Or we could end two minutes early if you want nothing. Maybe everyone already left two minutes early. <laughs> So this is a pretty pretty typical question here. Which of the following gives the best investment? So our principal is just going to be 600 bucks. Okay? That's something that all of you if you decided right now you were going to invest $600, you might be able to do that, right? You, you might be able to swing that right now. Um and many of you are 20ish, right? So uh Maybe this summer you just set aside 600 bucks. Maybe this motivates you to do that. Maybe it doesn't. But here we go. Which of these follow uh, gives the best investment? 600 bucks invested at. Uh, here we go. 2.5 percent per year, compounded. Uh, Semi annually. Two point two five percent per year monthly, or two percent per year continuously. So this is a this is a very typical question. You go to the bank, you you have options for investing your six hundred bucks, or you go to Vanguard, or you go to some financial advisor, and you want to invest six hundred dollars this summer and they give you options right and so you you do little calculations like this and you decide based on your computations what you expect what I will say is two and a half percent this is abysmal this is terrible investment percentages just as an FYI but we'll do this problem nonetheless semi-annually means twice per year monthly means 12 times per year continuously means it doesn't it just always is compounding. We use a different formula for this, and the formula is A equals PERT, P E to the R T. So we'll do that one first. 2% as a decimal is 0 0.02. So that's our R. So 600 is our principal, that's the amount we start with. E is some number close to 2.7. So you take 0 0.02, multiply it by T. For the other ones, uh, 
Um, what is that one for? I think you're missing a T in there, Jay. That's for, that's for, um, there you go, yeah. Okay, so that is for something that compounds once per year, just one time per year, yeah. I'll show you how to do these ones, which compound multiple times in a year. I'll show you that here real quick. But we're over time, so I'll continue doing this and I'll continue recording. So I'll post it online after uh, after class here. You don't have to stick around if you don't have to. So so if you don't have the time. So thank you for coming. It's good to see all of you. Um, again, I'll keep the tape rolling here and I'll I'll upload this after if you have to go. Okay, um, let's write down the forms for the other one, and then what we'll do is we'll compute all of these for say. 45 years. We'll, we'll look at what happens to your $600 at this interest rate by the time you retire. Okay, so this is the form for continuous continuous uh, investment, continuous compound investment. If you don't have that, you need to use another form, which is something that I talk about in the, um, in the lecture, and I, I kind of spell out how it works. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use this one. So the amount of money or investment or something after time t, t years, is equal to your principal amount times essentially something like this, one plus your, your interest rate, essentially something like that. But you need to account for how many times it compounds. Okay, so your interest rate R is evenly divided between the number of times it compounds in a year. Does that make sense? It's like this first part, two and a half percent twice a year. They're not gonna give you two and a half percent every six months. They're gonna give you two and a half percent by the end of the year. Okay, so they take your 2.5% and they say in six months we'll give you 1.25%. Okay, so that's what this R over N is. It's your interest rate divided by your number of compoundings per year. And then this is raised to the total number of times that it sort of uh, compounds on itself. Which, remember, in every year is two times. Right, If it compounds n times, so semi-annually two times per year, you this happens twice in, ha in one year. In t years, it's n times t years, uh, times. So they evenly divide up your interest over the number of times per year, and then it compounds the number of years times n uh, in total. So what does this look like in our problem? It is 600. And I'll do this here for the for the top one. And then I'll do it here for the middle one. They both have the same principle. They both have this one. The one plus is just there to make it a number bigger than one. The interest rates are different. So this top one is 0. 0 0.025. The bottom one, the interest rate is 0 0.0225. And the number of times is 2 up here. And on the bottom one, it's 12 times per year. So now this is, this is where things get interesting. So I'm going to pull up a calculator because this sort of thing is not something you do without one. Um, so in your homework questions, feel free when they ask you for an approximate value, just get your calculator out. Um, on a test, I'm not going to ask you to compute these things. So this would be like your final answer. Okay? 
I'd ask you for the function. I would not ask you to even simplify parts of the function. So I am going to pull out a calculator here and multiply this out. So 600 times e to the Oh, sorry, I'm going to calculate this out for 45 years. I forgot to say that. So, right, I said you, as a young uh, student here, may be 20 years old. If you put $600 in some investment for 45 years, that is, this is savings, so you're going to take it out when you retire at 65 ish. How much would that 600 be? And just to note, again, 2.5%, 2.25%, these are very, very low. So this, this is definitely something that you could obtain over 45 years. So what do these things turn into? So 600 times e to the 0.02 times 45. So for the continuously compounding case, uh, that turns roughly into fourteen hundred dollars okay fourteen hundred bucks it's a long time to wait for another eight hundred and seventy five dollars but we're talking about an investment six hundred bucks here the bigger thing to understand here is that this has more than doubled at a very low interest rate if you put this at 5%, just to just to look at that, at 5%, this continuous interest turns into 5700 almost. Okay, so there, take that, take that and think about that. 5% is totally obtainable in the stock market. I think I talked about that in the in the lecture. What are these other ones? First off, are they going to be more or less? I think more or less, more or less than fourteen seventy-five. What do you think? So you take your six hundred dollars, you invest it for forty-five years, at a two point two five percent rate. It's higher interest rate. And it compounds 12 times a, a year instead of instead of continuously. Is it more or less? What's your gut feeling say? I I don't know. I I would guess something close because it's a higher interest rate, but it's not continuous. I think it's almost like a trick question. I I don't know. I don't know the answer. I was wrong. After 45 years, this is 1649. Mm, there we go. And this last one, 600 times 1 plus 0 0.025 divided by 2 raised to the 2 times 45. We get eighteen hundred thirty five dollars. Yeah, this is one of those trick questions. See, continuously compounding interest is really, really attractive. But if the percentage is too low, it, it's outdone. It's outdone in this span of time uh, by two and a half and two point two five percent. So which gives the best investment? The, the two and a half per year compounded semi-annually. Okay. Um, that's it, that's all I got for you. So if you have questions, uh, you can shoot me an email, you can ask them now. Um, I'll be there for office hours tomorrow. 
<clears throat> so if you if you want to stop by, you can do that. Uh, on the test, if you want to go through your answers with me, if you want to go through uh, my grading of it, then we can schedule a time to do that. Uh, so just shoot me an email for that as well. Um, we have a quiz. Let me look at the schedule. We have a quiz this Friday on 3.1 and 3.2. Okay, um, Jay, I don't understand. 30th of March. On the 30th of March, we have office hours. Oh, uh, it's due the, t the homework for 3.3, 4.1, and 4.2. That's due, yeah, midnight on the 29th. Midnight on the 29th. It's due next Monday. Yep, the quiz for 3.1 and 3.2 is this Friday. Oh, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, I'm not sure that with the time changes there. Yeah, I'll leave I'll leave I'll leave the difficult math problems like time calculations to you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll handle the easy math problems. Okay. Well, I think that's it. So Thank you for stopping by. I'll see you all next time. Nine and a half hours difference. That's interesting, nine and a half hours. There must be some, yes, yeah, some, in the United States, time differences are only by the hour. They, they don't do any time changes by half hour. Does India do half hour time differences? Huh, okay. So it, it's either 9 or 10 then, right? Or maybe there's some time zone that I, I don't know about, or it's half an hour different. I don't know. And there are some countries that don't even, you know, don't observe daylight savings times and others that do, so maybe there's, maybe there's something odd going on there too. Okay, uh, Jay or Saria, did, did you have questions, or are you just hanging around a little bit? Like I, I'm 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 happy to stick around for you. Right. Okay. All right. I'll see you later, Jay. You're welcome. And uh, Saria, did you have a question? Okay, I'm guessing you just stepped away from your computer. So I'm gonna go ahead and close the room and and you can shoot me an email if you if you didn't uh, mean to stick around. Or if you did mean to stick around rather. Okay.